Uh, I'm now going to call on uh, Dr. Bruce Coleman, who uh, is professor in uh, our uh, um, College of Ag Bio and also a member of the organizing committee to introduce our next speaker. Bruce. Thank you, Morris. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Enteranya Sanginga. Sanginga is the uh, Director General of the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. He's been in this position since 2011. Uh, IITA is uh, one of the 15 centers in the CGIAR system, and I've had the opportunity to work with Sanginga over this period of time as a member of the Board of Trustees of this institute. So Sanginga is a, a native of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He uh, trained as a soil scientist, uh, doing most of his uh, graduate work at uh, IITA, so his roots go back to this institute, and uh, he spent some time as a scientist there as well. So he has a long history of experience uh, in international agriculture research in Africa and also in other uh, continents. Um, his work has focused on applied micro microbial ecology, plant nutrition, and integrated natural resource management. So prior to coming to, uh, as a DG of IITA, uh, he was the director of uh, CIET, another uh, CG center, uh, their African program in uh, Nairobi, which focused on land resource management. So since assuming uh, leadership of IITA in 2011, the uh, institute funding has increased greatly. Uh, new facilities have been uh, built across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and the number of scientists has doubled. So the scientific capacity of the institute has uh, increased greatly under his watch. Uh, he has focused the institute on delivery uh, of technologies that have been developed by IITA and other CG centers. And so uh, a business incubation platform has been developed to uh, to uh, increase some of the technologies and uh, get them out uh, 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 to, to businesses uh, in Africa. Uh, also, IIT will be playing a, a leading role in the recently instituted technologies for African agriculture development, uh, which, um, or <clears throat> agriculture transmission, uh, transformation, which has been funded by the uh, African uh, Agriculture Development Bank. Now, Sanginga also believes that one of the keys to the development or the transformation of Af African agriculture is the engagement of youth in agriculture. And so that uh, he's going to talk about uh, an agripreneurship program that, uh, uh, that he has developed uh, through IITA, and that will be his, uh, the topic of his presentation today. So please join me in welcoming Sanginga. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Um, I have to say I'm quite privileged today because I have uh, three former board members of IITA who are part of the organizing committee. Uh, that's uh, John Pickett, uh, Hans, and uh, Bruce. Just a few words um, on Bruce. Um, I started my work uh, under his leadership as the chair. This has been seven years. And uh, he has uh, retired, I think, uh, just last uh, April. And ITA has decided to nominate him as uh, board member em emerit. This is going to be the first time that uh, that is done. So thank you, Bruce, and it's really a pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm going to not talk very much about science. I wish I could. But uh, I'll try to demonstrate how um, we are trying to create jobs, especially for the youth, through technologies and um, uh, research. Uh, just a little bit IITA. Um, that's our headquarters. Um, this is quite interesting, uh, where basically you see near the house is there. That's the kind of uh, situation where um, uh, the forest on the right has been degraded completely. After 50 years, uh, basically, you are growing food on subsoil, and uh, that's almost typical in um, some of the African countries and so on. And uh, what we've been trying to do there is um, 
basically trying to imagine a situation where uh, you restore your souls on the other side to the secondary forest as it's been in the past. So our mandate crops work on nine mandate crops, soybean, banana, cassava, cocoa, plantain, maize, cassava, and so on and so forth. We are located in um, 18 countries in Africa, and we have uh, hubs basically in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, and uh, Central Africa. And uh, I'm glad that the um, member of the parliament, uh, IT is very well located in Uganda, and they do a lot of work on bananas. Now, let me talk about these challenges in Africa for the moment. When you meet a head of state in Africa, and I meet quite a lot of them, 10 years ago, they would talk about poverty, they would talk about nutrition, but today, all what they ask you is, how can you help me with your science to reduce my import food bill? So Africa is importing almost $35 billion per year as food. And this ironic is most of the time the food we can produce in Africa. And uh, what it means that we import rice from Thailand, for example. We are basically creating jobs in Thailand instead of creating it in Africa. And we can produce all those commodities in Africa. If we don't do anything and we don't change that equation, the bill in 2025 will be 110 billion job, uh, money. Jobs created in Canada or in the US on wheat, instead of creating those jobs in Africa. The second problem we have is that uh, our farmers are aging. The average age is 63, and there will be a big gap between the people like me and the next generation of um, young farmers. A gap of 30 years, because the young people are not interested in agriculture. And we're trying to imagine the consequences of not having farmers in Africa for the next coming 20 or 30 years. So we need to do something about that. And the member of the parliament has talked about 60% of unemployment rate. In some places, it's even 90%. Some governments can't just create jobs. So we need to change the mindset, not only the people, even the government the mind-changing set of the leaders. Now, for the last past uh, 50 years, agriculture in Africa has been considered like a social activity. You go, you have a minister, he goes to negotiate, and he's negotiating for a grant for agriculture. Every funding in the Ministry of Agriculture has to come from donors. So, no, wonder in my mind that agriculture, taking that way, has been associated most of the time with what are called the three Ps, pen, penury, and poverty. So we need to change that mindset, and that's what we're trying to do with uh, what I'm going to talk about here, where agriculture has to be a business. And it's start changing the mindset, not only the leaders, but changing the mindset of the young people we have for this moment. I want to use an example of Nigeria. Per year, Nigeria imports 11 billion, worse than job, on wheat. We can produce wheat in the northern part of Nigeria. Rice, we import rice from Thailand and so on. You can produce rice in all ecologies in Nigeria. So sugar and fish. Now, if you take 11 million, which for a country has the youth unemployment of 60%, that's almost 17 million young people. And if you are a leader and you said, well, I want to create jobs, I want to use this money to grow the food locally, 
And I want to take these young people, I want to create one million job for a young person worth earning $1,000 a month a graduate. You can do mathematically, you can reduce the unemployment rate of 60% to 7% in 10 years, if you have the good will. And sometimes I wonder why we don't do that, because this is really possible. So I'm going to give you an example of what Nigeria was in the 60s. Nigeria was the first producer of granite. During those days, in Kano, this is, was the situation of granite. This was kind of a pyramid, and granite was exported all over the world. But today, Nigeria is not producing anything. And one of the reasons was that in the 70s, the granite became infested by this fungus called aflatoxin, Aspirigius flavus. Of course, we couldn't trade anymore, and this production went completely zeros. And it was not only in granite, it's in maize as well. And this fungi is not only uh, preventing that the trade happen, but most of the time, this is really very, very detrimental for, uh, the, um, uh, for, for the health. And most of the time, uh, when people were diagnosed with cancer, we thought that was witchcraft, but that was basically because of aflatoxin produced by this fungi. And in some countries, like in Kenya, every season you have 200 or 400 people dying because of eating maize and granite, which is contaminated by um, this fungus producing aflatoxin. So ITA, we have done research almost uh, for 20 years, where we were using the biocontrol bio agent. Basically, this fungi that colonize uh, the maize and so on have a natural enemy, which is another fungi, which is able to dominate uh, basically this population and can reduce the level. So we did research, sorry, research for almost 20 years, and uh, we came with uh, this product, which is uh, a biocontrol agent against that fungi, and we call it Aflasafe. And this product in the U.S., um, the aflatoxin was a major problem, and the work with the, US, the USDA to come uh, with this product, which uh, we are using. And with this product, we are able to reduce the level of contamination by almost 80% in the feed in the granite, and is quite persistent. So we did that, and we started working with a few farmers on some pilot studies. And in 19, 2011, Bill Gates came to visit, he had given us a grant to work with, on this pro problem, and he came and visited us. And it was just the time when I was um, DG elect. So I was there with him. And uh, yes, he was quite impressed with the result, but he asked me a question. And he said, OK, well, this is really good. You're working with 100 farmers and so on. You can't make a difference with this. So tell me, if you want to reach millions of farmers, what do you need to do? Uh, basically, uh, he gave us uh, two months to give an answer. And uh, that's the time we start thinking as a research institution. Basically, we were spending a lot of time doing research and making sure that you get uh, some um, result which could uh, be piloted, and you expect the extension agent to take it. We started thinking as well about uh, uh, the capacity of uh, the people building capacity. And uh, in the 70s, and I was uh, probably not necessarily a victim of that, some of us have been trained in the US or in Europe, and sometimes you train on some of the matters which are not relevant to the problem which 
are uh, basically you have to solve in uh, your country. So in discussing with colleagues and so on, we realize that what we're missing in terms of our mission was delivery. And we found that there's a very important missing links between the capacity of the people we had and sometimes the research you're doing which is not relevant. So we needed to find those missing, missing links and how we could scale some of the technology which was quite successful to some few people. And at the time we came with uh, the idea of commercializing some of the technologies we had. I think yesterday or someone was mentioning the delivery part of uh, what we do is really quite important and extremely important in the continent like Africa where technology stays on shelves as they are not being uh, very basically scale up. So we decided, and I'm glad Hans is here, he was uh, one of uh, the champions on this to create what we call the business incubation platform. The idea was to change this model we were using, that's where Bill asked the question, how do, with what you are doing with the extension you reach, this is a few people, hundreds of people, but I want you to reach millions. So we decided to create some business incubation and come with a product which could be commercialized that's working with private sector and using that model was expecting to reach so many people. So we created the three factory and I'll come back still on the AfraSef. Uh, at IIT was just a research institution, but using the new philosophy of scaling our technologies, we start building some modular factory to produce uh, those products in mass. So we build this AfraSef and uh, it was the first build in, um, uh, in Africa. And uh, well, it was modeled from the one in Arizona, uh, which was used to uh, basically fight the same problem of aflatoxin in the US. And uh, we started producing uh, some of this uh, product. And uh, yes, uh, we started very small, but uh, basically you can see that the quantity we're producing, uh, with time, the increase because the demand became very important. I just remember when the president of Kenya visited Nigeria and he was trying to solve the problem of aflatoxin for maize in Kenya, he called upon us. And for two years, they were airlifting the product from Nigeria to Kenya. And uh, I'm quite happy that um, the result we're getting were so, so, so convincing in terms of people uh, just adopting and in terms of um, uh, land area, that uh, basically uh, the target we have is uh, almost working in 11 countries and uh, trying to basically uh, protect around uh, half a million of he hectare in five years. And the private sector has been taking these technologies that we have basically just um, continued doing uh, research and uh, coming with a new product. And uh, we've seen the extension most of the country because this problem is across Africa and we see a lot of countries looking for it and those showing the places where we have, uh, like in Nigeria and Kenya, where we've built factories to produce um, this product and uh, we see other countries trying to adopt it and uh, uh, resolving really the problem of uh, maize quality and uh, granite. Yeah, just another example of what is really happening in Africa. Cassava is going to be the most important industrial crop in, Nigeria, in, in Africa. And we have to pay attention, and IT is spending most, probably two thirds of our time working on cassava. Because cassava is not only for food, is really a very, very good industrial crop, as you are going to see. And uh, using the example of Brazil or Thailand, we can see the kind of industrial benefits that uh, cassava is going to go. And our research shows that most of the cassava, just uh, crop in Nigeria, for example, come from IT research. So 
And the cassava, as I said, it's industrial, and you have so many products. I just remember one month ago, the uh, Pepsi and Coca-Cola came to ITA. They turned to look for sweetener from cassava for the uh, products. The breweries, they are really looking for the starch coming from And all the pharmaceutical companies using cassava as a coating for medication and so on. So there are a lot of industrial use. And in Nigeria for this moment, we are saving a lot of money from the wheat um, uh, substitution by cassava by 20% and we were able to save almost $1 billion saving, which we couldn't do before, by replacing 20% of weed by cassava. So we have a lot of um, hope that uh, locally we could start basically producing some of the things that are going to be useful for the continent. More importantly is that in starting using the local initiative and so on, we'll be creating local jobs. And that's really very important. And that brings me to the point of talking about the youth in the job. This is a picture of uh, uh, Susie. One month ago, I was in Nairobi, and uh, this was a newspaper. Uh, she finished her degree almost in 2000, um, 2000, uh, 2000 yes. And in 2018, she still doesn't have a job. 18 years, the newspaper. He, that's in Kenya. This picture, if you see here, you will think, because Nigeria is qualified to the World Cup, you will think Nigeria is playing Germany in the World Cup here. The people are in the stadium here. This was not the case. This was uh, a call for 5,000 jobs for graduate, for immigration, and there were 11 million young people who apply for, I think one million apply for that. So there was no place where you could put all these young people and then to use stadium basically to receive their application. And every time when they're calling a name, suppose they call John Pickett, there will be 20 John Pickett in the stadium with the same name, and they will all rush to go and give papers. For 5,000 jobs, 1 million in the stadium, and uh, there were almost 20 young people graduate dying because everybody wants to get a job. That's how tragic some of the situation could be. Here, this is the gate of IITA. ITA is on 1,000 hectares. We employ per day 1,000 people coming on the campus. Every Monday of the month, we employ what we call the casual workers. And those casual workers, they go to weed and cassava fields, they go and clean, paint, and so on. So this, is, this day, uh, I was um, just driving around the campus, and I saw young people fighting with the police. Because the police were trying to put the order, and but everybody wanted to come into IITA. So almost 400 young people. So I stopped, and I started inter interrogating, interviewing all those young people. And I was asking a simple question. Where are you coming from? What are you coming to do here? And what did you study? I spent three hours doing that, because I just want to be sure. And most of the young people, it was, I'm a graduate in uh, biotechnology, mass communication, physics. I'm a lawyer, and so on, with other jobs that are coming for basically this many. And one of them is going to talk, Molayo, she's here. Molayo, where are you? Stand up. Yeah, she's one of them who was in that group. So. I decided that we have to do something about that. That was in 2012. So I picked 50 of them as a sample, and I said, call them in my office, and I said, you are a, you are a graduate, you don't have a job, the government can't give you a job, you come here and um, if you're lucky, we take you for one day, 
maybe we take maybe one third of those people who are there. So why can't we use agriculture as a mean for a job and occupation? And at that time, we start discussing with them, and it was very important just to change the mindset that agriculture is not only punishment, is not only pain, agriculture is a value chain. You can get some other opportunities in transforming, in transportation, logistics. Just to explain that, because that has never been in the curriculum of the universities and um, the school. So the, with these 50 young people, we decided that we're going to start an experiment. And I wanted to make sure that because they're coming into IIT, that the mindset is, oh, I'm going to stay here for some time, then I'll get a job. So I said, for six months, you're not going to get any salary we pay for your lunch and your transport, but we have to start this program together. And we sit down and we decided that uh, this uh, is a hypoth hypothesis was uh, going to be probably a normal salary of a graduate when you're starting in Nigeria is around $350. And we said if we do very well, individually probably we can double that in three years time. But we said as well that we have to create an advocacy group that is going to be speaking, the young people speaking for the young people as with the old people will be one of the objectives that we are going to pursue. And uh, we sit down after two or three months, we had a strategy which was based on three pillars. Basically capacity building, not only in terms of technologies, but in business as well. And it has to be based on the technologies generated by the research or the institution like IIT and so on. And we decided that uh, we have to advocate, we have to start to really increasing our voices to politicians and so on, and even to donors. And our expected outcome, we measured them, and we said, if we do well, probably 20% of the young people will be self-employed. 10% will work in that business incubation platform that I described of IITA. Private sector will pick some. And we gave ourselves, we were not sure that we were going to be successful, 20% a margin of uh, error and uh, failure. And basically, this is a group that we started with, and we absolutely agreed that it has to be a gender balance of the young uh, ladies and the young, uh, they had different backgrounds, there were some computer scientists among them, lawyers, and so on. So it was not necessarily the agriculturists that was part of that program. We have lawyers, we have med medical doctors in the group there. And this was basically the approach that we had followed. Uh, we spent uh, almost six months training, changing a mindset, and so on. And they started testing their own products in a group of two, three, four. And uh, then um, uh, basically just discussing, um, making some survey on markets, business. And uh, we have some after 18 months who were able to start their own business, and I'm going to give an example of that. So this has been the model that we follow, and basically takes around between nine and 18 months. And after a certain time, we, around 50, we made some analysis, really trying to find out what was going in their mind. And uh, it was quite interesting, after training after six months, 70% of them decided to create their own business. They were telling me, we are not interested anymore in looking for jobs, we can create our own jobs. I can create my own business. And you're going to see a good, good example of that. For me, once we reach that level, after 18 months, I was quite satisfied that the mindset really trying to change because we've been educated in Africa to go and uh, you got your degree and you have to go and look for a job and not create jobs. That's never been in our mind. But these young people, at this point in time, they said no more, go and uh, look for uh, this scholar job, uh, what scholar. 
So after a few months, 18 months, the situation, we had among them created about 51 business enterprises in Nigeria, Congo, Kenya, and Uganda. And this involved around 115 graduates. And our target is 5,000 businesses in three years. And we've seen some startup already. ITA was able to give for the startup to test that experiment between 5 and 30K. And, uh, but all the businesses that they've developed require around $4 million. So I'll give you an example of one of them. This is a young people. She's an economist. She's called IBK. Uh, traveled with her to Germany uh, last, uh, last uh, April. And uh, it was very interesting to see the kind of presentation she was giving, uh, showing what she's been doing. She called herself a chicken lady. Uh, she started basically with uh, a few broilers, 500. I'd given her uh, around 5,000 to the group. And a uh, few months later, she basically contacted her friend here, Yetunde, and they found an angel donor uh, from Holland, and where they share the capital. She has 30% in it, 30% for Yetunde, and the angel investor has put 40% in it. And uh, they have um, even an organogram of uh, their uh, business and how uh, this good plan on how to, to do a business. They started with $5,000. And um, they started using the kind of rudimentary techniques and so on, growing and selling uh, basically all uh, those broilers. And uh, actually, at our center, we eat all what they produce and there is a market. Because Nigeria imports almost 70% of the chicken from Brazil. And these young people can produce it. It's ironic what we see in the continent. And it's not only Nigeria, Congo, the same, and so on and so forth. And you have young people who can produce chicken everywhere. So they uh, started that, and uh, they use rudimentary way of marketing the chicken. It's on the road. And the chicken, people come and buy, and uh, you, you know, it's very active, and, um, and they keep learning. And uh, nine months later, they said, oh, well, we are producing enough. Let's uh, build a restaurant where they can uh, retail and uh, start um, uh, selling to all, all the people. This, uh, uh, the way you find chicken uh, in the U.S. and so on, they uh, decided to do that. So what they've done, uh, when they started, they been able to buy a piece of land, and they've been able to mobilize almost uh, 100, um, uh, $120 or $20 here with the investor, and uh, basically, they know exactly what uh, they want, but they realize as well, for example, feed is uh, consume almost 60% of uh, the chicken cost. So they have plans as well to build the feeds and um, uh, all what is required to expand the business. This is an example of uh, the results they've been able to accomplish today. In 2017, they started with 500 broiler, they got the revenue of this much. And basically, what is really important, they've been able to employ nine more staff with what they want. They've made some progress here, but they have a clear idea of where they want to go. And basically, among the plans they do have, because they realize the needs, not only in Nigeria, they realize the need for other countries, the continent, what they are doing for the moment, a lot of people, young people coming from DRC or Kenya, they are coming to be trained by them, and they are going to form a network of uh, just uh, chicken um, farmers and uh, business, where uh, basically they can create some franchise and so on. So that's another example of uh, these three young people as well, from IIT as well, 
or the one in smoking catfish, and the market is in the US because a lot of Nigerians are in the US, in London, and they love cat, smoke catfish. So the market is basically in the US and uh, helping them to export. And uh, uh, these young people for 18 months, they are able to pay each of them uh, for, 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 for $50 per month. And they started with the money we gave them of uh, 15 and which is really interesting, they've reimbursed already in 13 months the money they got from us. So once we show this, I invited the president of the African Development Bank to come and see the example of what these young people were doing, and the bank decided that they are going to invest in the youth program following the model that we've established and uh, the vision is basically to have this program roll almost 25 countries, and the bank wants to invest around 12.5 billion, and these are the metrics that we want to achieve. And uh, yes, this program is ongoing already. It's not just a theory. It's going on in seven countries for the moment, with the country taking a loan for this program. And it's really based on capacity building, the financial businesses, and uh, of course the loan has to be also very important. Yeah, I, I think that's been uh, the experience uh, that we have on IITA. Uh, it's just starting, and, uh, but we are uh, quite encouraged with the mindset of the young people changing, uh, basically. And one of them is here, and she's going to give her own experience this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.